Welcome back to Module 5. We're going to be talking in this section about how we study exoplanets, because as we talk about the formation of stars, we want to recognize that these stars have systems of planets around them the same way that the sun has planets around it. So we're building off of some information that we've already started to learn from Module 4 when we talked about the study of binary stars, and we're going to be able to make a lot of connections to those uh, methods and tools. So when I say that, what I really mean is that the types of tools we have available to us in astronomy are very similar no matter what objects we're trying to study. The nuance of how we use those tools might be a little bit different, but when we look at the observations made, Doppler shift, looking at dips in the light curve, and taking images, we saw those same tools used for studying binary systems. Now if we think about a star and an exoplanet, and a reminder for us that the word exoplanet means a planet around a different star, not the sun. Uh, when we think about two binary stars, they're going to be two objects of relatively the same uh, mass. The big difference with a planet and a star is the mass difference is quite significant. The ratio between those masses is no longer so close. So it is harder to find these small exoplanets than it would be to find two bright shining stars. So the radial velocity method for exoplanets uses the Doppler shift of the star's spectrum entirely, and as the star moves a little bit towards us and away from us as it rotates around a center of mass, that tells us that something is tugging on it that would be a planet size. That radial velocity method is tricky and it requires us to be um, to have the technology to see very small Doppler shifts in a star spectrum that are separate from whether the star itself is moving relative to Earth. And it is sometimes referred to as stellar wobble. The next method we'll be seeing some examples of is the transit method. So this is by far the most common method used for um, detecting exoplanets, and mostly because of specific uh, surveys that used it. But that's watching a star and seeing that it's making the same amount of light until for short periods of time it makes less light because it's being blocked by a, an exoplanet. That's very similar to the eclipsing binary system, but we really only, um, for most of these systems, we really only see the planet going in front of the star, and we don't notice when the star goes behind uh, when the planet goes behind the star because the planet's not really producing its own light. It might be having some reflected light, but not enough to make a difference. And then direct imaging uh, is just taking an image of a system and seeing uh, that secondary object uh, either in infrared or radio. Uh, and we'll see an example of... Um, no, we won't see an example of that, uh, but we will, we will recognize that there are some observations like that. So uh, I want to make sure that we recognize that one of the big projects we're trying to do in this class is to explore an exoplanet system, and the NASA website Ways to Find a Planet does a great job with lots and lots of different um, neat animations that go into depth uh, where you can study more the specific uh, method that is relevant to your assigned exoplanet system. On the left here, we have the stellar wobble or radial velocity method where the star itself is moving towards us and away from us, and that tells us about the planet. And on the right, we see that indication of the, um, the transit method where the planet goes in front of the star and blocks a little bit of the light. Now, each of these methods has its own biases, uh, and I invite you to explore the data that's being um, posted here. It's a clickable link in our shared slides. On the left, we are showing some radial velocity detections up through 2019, and we're plotting planet mass as a function of orbital period, because the radial velocity method can only tell us mass initially, and then we have to do follow-up um, observations of a different type. And it is much easier for us to detect this tug, this stellar wobble, from higher mass objects. So those are less likely to find us Earth-sized objects. And even with the objects that are between Earth and Neptune mass, uh, it was really only really, really close in objects that are tugging on their star more than the Earth tugs on the, um, on the sun. 
So the Earth icon is indicated both at its mass and its orbital period. And then on the right we have transit detections, and you might recognize or notice that there are two main kind of blobs. In the upper left corner of that plot, with all those yellow points clustered together at very, very short orbital periods and very, very large planet radius, and note now that we are showing radius instead of mass, we see a whole bunch of objects that are referred to as hot Jupiters. Jupiter or larger objects that are very close to their host star, it's easy to find those because they block a big portion of their star and so they create dips in the light curve that are visible even without a specially designed uh, survey or instrument to be looking for those. So prior to the Kepler mission, which we'll be talking about in just a second, that was a very common type of planet to find because they're easy to find that does not make that a common actual type of exoplanet. When we add in all of the points from the Kepler mission, so those are most of the yellow points, especially all of these objects between Earth and Neptune sizes, uh, we find that uh, it is really common to have a planet, an exoplanet that's about twice the size of Earth or maybe half the size of Neptune. So the Kepler mission is one of the most widely contributing missions to our study and statistics of exoplanets. It ran from um, 2009 to 2013, uh, looking at a single patch of the sky. Uh, so its intention was not to find all exoplanets, but it was to give us a statistical sample of if we are looking at just this randomly picked patch of sky, uh, what kinds of planets do we find and how common are those planets around the stars in our field of view? And it had a um, portion of the mission break in 2013, so it could no longer point at that patch of sky, but instead kind of followed the ecliptic. So there was a K2 mission while the rest of the telescope was still fully functional um, to collect additional data, um, but in 2018 they decommissioned it. Now the discovery of an exoplanet requires three or more detected transits. The first time you see a dimming on a light curve, um, it could be anything passing in between you and the star. The second time you see it, you now have an estimated guess for the period of the orbit, and you can predict the third time you'll see a dip, and then when that prediction uh, holds true, that is a very strong um, support for a, a an exoplanet. So two transits tends to create um, candidates and then that third and future transits create um, confirmed exoplanets. So when we look at the number of exoplanets that we find per year, the transit method colored green here in the plot uh, and the largest of the sizes for each of these um, is by far the most plentiful because almost entirely from the Kepler mission. 75% of all the discoveries are from the transit method, and if you look at 2004 and 2016, those are data releases from the Kepler team where they made publicly available all of these different um, exoplanets that had gone from candidates to, to confirmed exoplanets, and that's where we see these just giant jumps where they're analyzing data in the intervening years but kind of publishing them all at once. So one of the biggest takeaways from the Kepler mission and all of the statistics that were um, gained from it are that there are more planets than there are stars in our galaxy. Now let's take a brief moment to kind of recognize what that means for us. Our own sun has eight planets, but that means that we could still find six other stars that have no planet systems at all and overall, in those systems, we would have more planets than stars. So the statistics tell us that planets are very common, but it does not tell us that all stars have to have planets. So that's often a kind of misunderstanding of the, the data, especially in kind of public releases um, or public articles. What's also worth recognizing is what was separately found is that the most common size of exoplanet was a size that we don't have in our solar system. 
If we have a rocky object that's maybe a little bit bigger or twice as big as the Earth, we refer to that as a super Earth in exoplanet discoveries. Or if we have a gaseous or icy planet that is smaller than Neptune, uh, maybe half the size of Neptune, we would call that a mini Neptune. So we don't have enough um, information just from the transit method to be able to know the composition, because you need to know the mass and the radius for that. Um, but we can say for sure that the size um, of the most common type of planet would be something like a mini Neptune or a super Earth. So the um, biggest reason that the Kepler mission um, in its K2 format was uh, taken down in 2018 is that's when TESS um, went online. So TESS is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite and kind of passed the baton um, from Kepler to TESS. So there were very different goals for these two missions. The Kepler mission was designed to look at a very small patch of the sky, but get statistics for um, all the way out to very large distances in that direction. The TESS mission was never designed to do that. It is trying to do an all-sky survey and look for things close by. Look for all of the exoplanets and exoplanet candidates that are within 200 light years of us. So different missions, um, different goals, and we're still learning a lot from that data set. There are also ground-based exoplanet projects that are ongoing, like TRAPPIST. Um, the TRAPPIST-1 mission was a big publicity um, uh, reveal in February 2017, where there was a um, smaller red star that had seven different exoplanets, all roughly Earth-sized. Uh, and that TRAPPIST mission is continuing to search for things. And then MIRTH uh, stands uh, for a project that is looking for Earth-like planets around M stars. Uh, and then JW JWST has a lot of different science goals, but exoplanets is one of them. And so it was launched in 2021 and will continue to aid in our finding and follow-up study of exoplanets. Now, if we want to know exactly what a planet is made out of, so we can find an Earth-like planet, we do need to know its mass and radius. And that data set is significantly smaller than the 5,000 confirmed exoplanets that we have from different methods. So we need mass and radius, that's follow-up information to get us both things. And then that gives us a density. And this plot is showing us for the red points all of the densities that we have um, calculated for exoplanets. And in green triangles, we have um, six of our planets in our solar system indicated. So right near uh, one, we have Venus and Jupiter. Then just past 10 Earth masses, we have two triangles next to each other for Uranus and Neptune. Then just past 100 masses, we have the triangle for Saturn, and near 300 um, Earth masses, we have the triangle for Jupiter. Now you'll notice that the triangles for Venus and um, Earth are between the iron and rock lines because we have an iron core and a rocky outer um, surface. The water we have is very sparse, so we aren't a water world. Whereas the um, points for Uranus and Neptune are between the water and hydrogen lines because they are ices as well as having gaseous material in their outer layers. And then we can see some of these exoplanets at the largest masses that are very, very um, puffy. They're very low density. Those are those hot Jupiters I was um, mentioning before. They are so close to their um, host stars that they are even less dense than hydrogen at cold temperatures because they're all puffed up from that heat. So if we're looking for a rocky planet, we don't have that many confirmed yet. Uh, and we also want that planet if it has a rocky surface, we also want it to be in the habitable zone so that we could kind of imagine some other civilization living there. The habitable zone is defined as the distance you need to be away from your host star to have liquid water on your surface. If you're too hot, uh, too close to your um, host star, it'll be too hot. And if you're too far away from your host star, you'll be past the ice line, you'll have ices instead of liquid. In our solar system, uh, the bottom of this image, the Earth is right um, in the middle of the habitable zone, very helpful for us. Venus, um, it could be argued, 
could be in the habitable zone if it had a thinner atmosphere. Mars, it could be argued, could be in the habitable zone if it had a thicker atmosphere. Neither one of those have um, standing liquid water, so um, they don't really count for us, but they could in slightly different circumstances. If we were looking at planets around a smaller, cooler star, that whole habitable zone is physically closer to the star. Uh, and so it is, it is something that shifts with the star properties, which is why we need to know about those star properties. So what I'll leave you with is that um, although it is really interesting and exciting to study all of these different exoplanets, and I look forward to the projects on these, um, it is not something where we're imagining that this is going to be a place that humanity then moves to. We need to take care of our own planet. There is no planet B. There's no backup um, planet to, to change our, um, our civilization to once we find it. Uh, this image is taken um, of the Earth-Moon system from the Voyager spacecraft, and it reminds us of just how, um, just how rare it is to have a habitable planet like the one that we do, and how important it is to take care of it. So, I look forward to continuing our discussion of stars and stellar evolution in future videos. Thank you for watching.